Well, I want to tell you about a guy this morning. Uh, his name is Simeon, and he's part of the Christmas story. We just don't hear about him a whole lot all the time. And, uh, and I was thinking about this. I think he could have written that last song. Uh, I don't think it was written that long ago, but he might as well have. And you'll see why here in just a moment. So uh, we're going to get into the book of Luke today, and we're going to look at the life of Simeon. And I want to talk about Simeon. He's someone in the Christmas story you don't hear a whole lot about. Can you turn this down some, please? Last week I talked about Joseph, someone else that maybe doesn't get all the credit in the Christmas story. Uh, somehow the shepherds get more uh, screen time than Joseph. I'm not sure how that works. Uh, Simeon certainly does not. And so we're going to look at here in his life and what he's up to here in Luke chapter 2. Uh, you can follow along with us in the church app. We have an app, and just go to your app store and search Abundant Life Ording, and you will find it there. And there's a little tree that you will look for, and that is the app. Our sermon notes are in there, our past sermon video, audio, uh, giving, all that is all part of that app, and you can be a part of that as well. And uh, if you're new with us, welcome. If you're visiting, welcome. It's good to have you here during this Christmas season. We hope you'll join us on Friday night as well. We're going to have a good time. I want to I talk to you about waiting this morning. Sometimes we wait for things. Have you ever had to wait for something before that you didn't want to have to wait for? Yeah? <laughs> waiting in traffic, waiting in line, waiting for a surprise. Some, some of you have been pregnant or are pregnant, and, and you were like, like just, just come, come already. already. Come on, child. It's been, it's been enough, enough time. time. Waiting. We don't like to wait, but there's, there's a waiting that God puts in every human heart. There's a waiting that he has, that he places within us, that we're waiting for God to do something. We're waiting for something bigger. We're waiting, and, and some of you can recall the time in your life where you had not heard of God or of Jesus or received Jesus, and maybe you're in that place today, and you remember that there was something lacking, there was something missing, there's something that you're waiting for. And I was thinking back on this this movie that came out in 2007 uh, called Bucket List. It was um, Jack Nicholson and Morgan Freeman. And uh, they, they, the movie was called The Bucket List. And uh, it originally had a different title, which was like Things to Do Before I Die. Like that was the original title and that wasn't catchy. So they switched it to Bucket List. It's a story if you haven't seen. It's a story of two terminally ill men and they get stuck together in a hospital room and they are um, not real fond of each other at the beginning. And they realize through talking that there's so many things in their life that they haven't done. And they've faced with their death and they realize there's so much that I wanted to do but I haven't done. And they came up with this idea, let's just go do it. And so they begin to make a list of things to do before they kick the bucket. That was their, that was their goal. And, uh, and off of that, so they set off on this adventure and they go skydiving and all kinds of crazy things. But out of this movie, actually, like culturally, now there's a term in our culture, bucket list, if you have not heard this term. What's on your bucket list? Meaning, what are some things that you want to do before you die? And, uh, and the phrase isn't all that old. And so here we have this idea of a bucket list. And actually, long before 2007, there was a guy in the Bible, Simeon. He had a bucket list. I don't know if you knew that. He had a things to do. There was something he wanted to do before he died. And, uh, and this, so this isn't a new concept. And so here's the thing. He only had one item on his bucket list, just one. And that was he wanted to see the Savior, the Messiah that had been promised through the prophets before he died. And he had a word from the Lord that he would see the Savior of the world before he died. And so he waited. And we pick up here in Luke chapter 2, verse 22. And just to set up the, the story for you, the scene for you, um, What's happened so far, you may have heard the story if you've been around uh, for Christmas at all in your life, there was a baby that was born in Bethlehem. Is anyone aware of that story? It's a good one. We're going to talk about it Friday night. This baby has been born in Bethlehem, and what happens is the angels have appeared in the, to the shepherds, declaring the Savior is born. The shepherds come and see him. And then it says in our text that eight days later after he was born, he was taken to be circumcised. That was the custom of the law for the Jews. And the name was given to him, Jesus. This name was given to him, we know by his father, Joseph, as the angel appeared to Joseph and said, you will name him Jesus. And so he was named Jesus. And now we pick up in Luke chapter 2, 22, and it's about a month later. It's a month down the road. And, uh, and so that's where we're going to look at our story. And so Mary and Joseph, they, they've taken about a five to seven mile 
walk, trek, however they got there. Maybe they took caravan. And they went to Jerusalem to offer a sacrifice and dedicate him to the Lord. I actually went on Google Earth this week to look at where they were versus where they were going. And if they were to walk, it was about a two-hour and 20-minute walk uh, from where they were at to Jerusalem. So they set off. Now, they didn't just, they couldn't get on a plane. They didn't have a car and all that kind of stuff. So they went to Jerusalem and they were, their purpose there was to offer a sacrifice and to dedicate Jesus to the Lord as was custom. And so let's read through our scripture, Luke 2, 22. We're going to go through verse 33 this morning and then we'll, we'll talk about what this is telling us today. Uh, it says, when the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord as it was written in the law of the Lord. Every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Uh, the word, it's funny, I think the word is actually in the original language is turtle doves, so you can look up what that is. Now there is a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought into the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms, praising God and saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. So Simeon was waiting for something. As much as we wait for some things in our life, Simeon was waiting something. What was he waiting for? And as I read this text, I wonder, does he even know what he was waiting for? He had a promise from God. Now, some of you have had a promise from God, but you don't know all the details. You don't know what it looks like. And so Simeon's here, and he's waiting for something. And we don't have any indication that Simeon was giving any details to this, just that you would see the Lord's Messiah. You would see the promised one that the prophets prophesied about. Before you die, you would see this Messiah. We don't have any evidence that he was given a description or an age or a timeline or a photo. Definitely not a photo. He wasn't given any of those things. How do you know what you're looking for? How do you know what you're trying to find when you don't know what it is? Can you imagine what that must have been like for Simeon? He was told, you will see the promised one. You will see the Savior of the world before you die. I wonder what his every day was like when he went to the temple or around town, looking around, wondering, could he be the one? Could he be the one? And I just wonder what that was like. We were told that in the text or he was waiting for the Lord's Messiah, or it says the consolation of Israel, which those phrases might not mean a lot to us, but they meant something to Simeon. You see, he was relying on the scripture. That's all he had to go off of. Prophecies from the Old Testament. He, God had spoken to him and given an indication that he was going to see something, and the only thing he had to rely on was guidance from God's word. And you know, today in our life, it's okay to have God's word be that same guidance for you in your life when you're waiting on something, when you're unsure of where to turn or what to do next, and we turn to God's word and we say, okay, God, your word is truth. Your word is alive. Speak to me. And so those were the only clues that he had. And we know in the book of Isaiah, and there were several clues in the Old Testament, the prophets spoke. In Isaiah chapter 9, starting with verse 6, it says, for unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. That was the promised Messiah. That was what he was waiting for. This is who all of Israel was looking for. And in that moment, in that promise from the Holy Spirit, I just have to wonder, did he really know what he was looking for? Because if I put myself in his shoes and I have that scripture, honestly, I don't know that I'm looking for a baby and a child at this point. When I hear that he's, the government's going to be on his shoulders, he's going to be great and his kingdom is going to rule, maybe I'm looking for a king. 
Maybe I'm looking for someone who was born into royalty. I'm looking, okay, let's look at the royal lines. Who is it that could come in the kingly line and could begin to reign? And maybe I'm looking there. Maybe I'm, I'm looking for this royal child, if I'm looking for a child of all. Or maybe I'm looking around in my community. Okay, who are the people of wealth and status and prominence that could potentially rise up and be this one that Scripture tells me that's so great and that's so, so mighty and will, will do all these things? Certainly, there's a person of influence. And certainly, when this king and this Messiah and this promised one comes, like there's going to be some kind of pomp and circumstance. There's going to be an announcement, a, a holy announcement, maybe some family ties to King David, that's who you're looking for. That's who I'm looking for. If I read Isaiah, I'm looking for the parade. When the parade comes, I'm looking for the one. And that's not how Jesus came to Simeon at all. And you know, that's not how he comes to you either. That's not how he comes to me. It's not in the middle of all of the parade and all of the big and all of the things. You know, the first thing I want us to look at this morning when we're waiting is that Jesus shows up in the ordinary. He shows up in the everyday, ordinary, seemingly nothing life of ours. He shows up in the midst of the ordinary. You see, there was nothing at all spectacular about Jesus showing up that day at the temple. Nothing. Simeon is at the temple, and Mary and Joseph show up with their baby, and it was nothing but just an ordinary day. It was an ordinary thing. It was an ordinary sacrifice. There was nothing that would stand out about Jesus to Simeon except for that he was waiting and that he was looking and that he was searching and that his heart was open, his eyes were open to see. This ordinary day was something that was normal in the life of the Israelites, and it may not seem normal to you and me as we look at this story and say they brought Jesus to the temple and they sacrificed and they, and they would, would dedicate him to the Lord. Maybe that doesn't seem like everyday life. Maybe that's a special occasion. Some of you have dedicated your children to the Lord here at Abundant Life, and that's not an ordinary day. That's a special day. You get the, you know, the special dress and the special outfit, and the family comes, and it's a big deal. But here, it's ordinary life. We look back to Leviticus chapter 12, and I want to read you a couple verses out of Leviticus chapter 12 to really understand why Mary and Joseph had gone there in the first place. It says in verse 6 of Leviticus 12, When the days of her purification for a son or daughter are over, she is to bring to the priest at the entrance of the tent of meeting a year-old lamb for a burnt offering and a young pigeon for a dove for a sin offering. But if she cannot afford a lamb or a dove for a sin offering, she is to bring two turtle doves and a partridge. Now, I want to know where that partridge came from. Because I know the two turtle doves came from Scripture, but the rest of the song is pretty messy. Uh, or two pigeons, one for a burnt offering and the other for a sin offering. In this way, the priest will make atonement for her and she will be clean. You see, they were to come to the temple and they were to make two sacrifices. That was, that, that was it. There was a burnt offering. A, you would make a sacrifice that was a pleasing aroma to the Lord. And then you would make a, a sacrifice that would atone for your sins. Now, did you know that when you were born, you were born into sin? Did you know that when you had kids, they naturally sinned without you having to teach them how to? Did you figure that out? Yeah. Right? Those, some of the first words kids say, besides mama and dada, are no and mine. <laughs> Isn't that true? We learn to sin. We learn to sin. Just, it's just in us. And so there was a custom that when you were born, you would give the sacrifice for sin just right off the bat right at the very beginning. And actually, they were supposed to be sacrificing a lamb. Now, notice that in our, in our text in Luke that Mary and Joseph, they didn't sacrifice a lamb. They sacrificed, uh, they sacrificed two birds instead of what was the custom in Leviticus told us that they were supposed to sacrifice a lamb first and then a bird. That was the two things that they were supposed to sacrifice unless they were poor, unless they couldn't afford it. Unless they couldn't afford the lamb. Do you see the foreshadowing here? Like I, I, was, I saw something new for the first time. Like the, the lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world was present right there. And they come to the temple and, and the time for Jesus to die and give his life had not come. You see, Mary wasn't going to sacrifice a lamb that day. The lamb that she brought into the world would be sacrificed for you and for me someday. 
And so I was reading this story and I thought, my goodness, they came with two birds because they didn't have a lamb. That's what the text tells us. But I realized Mary did have a lamb. In fact, Mary had a little lamb. And I don't know if maybe that's where it came from. <laughs> wah, wah, wah. Dad jokes abound. It's Christmas. I get away with it. I don't know what to tell you. I just wonder, like, what's the history behind some of these things? My kids, did they walk out? They told me they were walking out if I used that joke. But it's all good. I live to embarrass my children. <laughs> it's, a, it's a goal of mine. You must embarrass your children. <laughs> Thank you, son. Nice job on the drums today, by the way. <laughs> I do think it's interesting, though, that, all kidding aside, that Mary came into the temple with the Lamb of God, and yet the text says she had no Lamb. And so they sacrificed these two doves. They had nothing. They had no money. He wasn't born into wealth. He was born into a, a place of poverty. And this act of coming into the temple... It was normal, everyday life. This is what would happen when anyone had a baby. This is what would happen. They would come into the temple. And, and trust me, there was lots of babies being born in this time. And so the parents, day after day, would be coming, and they would come to the temple. They'd offer their sacrifice just as you would come into church and sing your worship songs and give your tithe and, and listen to a message. It was just everyday, normal Jewish life, like you live an everyday, normal Christian life. Routine and ordinary. And it was in that ordinary. It was in this time where there was nothing extraordinary happened. There was surely, I believe, Simeon had, had been to the temple day after day waiting for this promise from the Lord, waiting to see the Messiah. And he had seen so many parents walk in and dedicate their child. He had, I, I don't even know the count. We know that from the text he was an old man. And we know that uh, he had been looking for the Messiah for some time. And so I wonder if he had seen hundreds and hundreds of parents come into the temple and offer their sacrifices and dedicate their child unto the Lord. And yet on this occasion, in this everyday, ordinary occasion, something was different. Something had changed. The, the temple hadn't changed. The people hadn't changed. There was no announcement. You had a man in waiting, a man who was waiting for something. He was waiting for a Savior, and Jesus who he was looking for, walked in. And the Spirit of God spoke to him and said, that's the Savior. And in our own lives, God will speak to us. The Spirit of God speaks to us in these times in our life when we're lost, when we're hurting, when we're hopeless, when we are a valley of dry bones, and the Spirit of God says, what you need is Jesus. Has anyone experienced that in your life? In the everyday ordinary, Jesus is what you need. But I love that Jesus comes in the ordinary, and, and what we find that what Jesus does when he comes in the ordinary is he brings peace. He brings peace to us. And this is a world that we live in that is looking for peace. And Jesus brings us to peace with God. That's the second lesson that we're going to learn from Simeon today, because he says, God, I'm at peace now. He says, okay, I've seen your salvation. I'm checking it off my bucket list. God, you can take me now. That's his cry out to God. I, I, and he doesn't say it that way, but he says, I'm at peace. I'm at peace now, God. I can go. All I have ever wanted, the one thing I was looking for, I'm there. And this old man had been waiting for some time. And now he has Jesus in his arms, looking right at peace, right in the face. He's looking at Jesus, and now he's at peace. Something has happened. Something has changed within him. He says, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation. You see, Scripture tells us that not only does Jesus bring us peace, he brings us peace with God. And I, in every human heart, I believe there is something within us that knows that there is something there where, where we don't measure up to the great standard of God. There's something within us in which we know there is something bigger than me. And Jesus comes into our life and he brings us to peace with a perfect God, a God that we can't measure up to, a God that is so holy, that is so great, that is so perfect, and we are so not. But when we have Jesus, we're at peace with God. In Luke 2, 
Previously in verse 14, remember what the angel said. Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace, goodwill toward men. Jesus brought peace. Jesus brought peace. I love in, in the Apostle Paul writes in Romans 5.1, he says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, in this season that we live in, we can be at peace with God too. We can be settled. We can be at peace with God and we look around our world and we see anything but peace. Do you find that it's hard to find peace in this world right now? That you look around the world and you realize there's some strife. If you haven't noticed it, man, I want to hang out at your house. <laughs> because you, everywhere you go, there's strife, there's division. I mean, this is an unprecedented time in our world in which always in our world there's been strife. Always in our world there's been division. But it's ramped up. In fact, the division and the strife and all those things, it's even found its way into the church. It's all over. It's everywhere you turn. And yet God calls us to be a people of peace and to be a people that are at peace with God. And so we look around our world and the turmoil and we, it carries through us. It goes within us and we, we look in our world. If you just looked at our world, you would feel hopeless. If you just looked out into this world, I've, I've heard perspectives of, man, bringing a child into this world would be a scary thing in this time of day. And some of you have done it and are doing it. Because it's so hopeless, but guess what? Bringing a child into this world is such a great time in history because they have an opportunity to change history for Jesus. You know, it comes down to the way our perspective is because if we have peace with God, we believe that he can do all things. Amen? Do you believe God can do all things? God can do all things, and so he brings peace within us when we feel empty inside. We know there's something more. I love the words, revival's in the air. Catch it if you can. Hope's returning. Dawn is breaking. It began as Simeon. I wonder if that was the feeling that he had in his heart as he held Jesus. That there was a peace. There was something that was different in this moment. And when we in our lives have done everything we can to find peace, we've, we've done it all. Jesus comes and he brings the peace that we need. He brings us to peace with God. Every single one of us should have an assurance in our life that you are at peace with God. There is a day for all of us where we will die, a day for all of us that we will go into eternity. And God's word says that when we have received Jesus as our Lord and Savior, the way that Simon said, I receive this Jesus as the Savior of the world, when we do that, we're at peace with God. And we too, like Simeon, can say, okay, God, I can go whenever. Now, if you're like me, I say, God, I don't want to go. <laughs> I want to be around for a long time because I have so much adventure to live. But God, I know that whenever that day is, and I prophesy it over my life, God, you know, in 55 years from now, when it's time for me to go and be with you, God, I am so grateful that I am at peace with you, God. I am at peace and that's where peace begins in our life. If you're looking for peace, it begins with knowing that you have peace with God. It begins with that place. And if you have never received Jesus, you can find peace with God by receiving Jesus. If you have received Jesus and you are in a place in your life where it's just turmoil and division and frustration and anxiety, you too can have peace because you're at peace with God. And you go back to that place where you remind yourself, I'm at peace with God. And because I'm at peace with God, I can have peace within myself. Because I have peace with God, I can have a peace that the world can't find. You talk to people in this world, they are looking for peace more than anything else. I mean, we're, you look in our world, people want hope. People want, but what, but what is it that's messing with people most in this world? Stress, anxiety depression, worry. You know what solves? You know what the opposite of all those things are? Peace. That God brings a peace that we can't understand. The Apostle Paul talks about peace, a kind of peace that goes beyond all of our understanding. When you have peace that goes past your understanding, that means that when your mind is absolutely going crazy, 
You say, okay, God, I'm thinking all these things, but in my spirit, in my heart, God, I know that I'm at peace. And I know that you've got this. I know that you have this. And God, I know that in my life, you can take care of all things. We can be confident, like Simeon, that whenever it is we go from this earth, we'll be at peace with God. Because when Jesus comes, when Jesus comes, it's, you know, Mary and Joseph came and it says that they brought a couple of sacrifices. Why? To wash away sin. But Jesus, now in our lives, he washes away sin. He's come, and he washes away guilt. He washes away shame. That when we fail, we can go to God, and we can say, God, I come before you, and I repent. God, I turn from my ways, and I come to you. Has anybody ever sinned before? Isn't that fun? Until it's not. Sin leads to death. And in our lives as Christians, we got to understand that this lifestyle of turning to Jesus and saying, Jesus, I want to be at peace with you. I want to be at peace with God. Jesus, I turn from my ways. It's a lifestyle, church. It's a lifestyle to come and to receive the peace of Jesus and receive who he is. And so Simeon looks at the face of Jesus and he says, I am at peace. And some of you this season, in all that you have going on, you just need to close your eyes. You need to look at the face of Jesus and just declare, Jesus, in you I'm at peace. I'm at peace. Take that deep breath. I am at peace. Now, why was Simon at peace? Simeon at peace, excuse me. He was at peace because the one he had been looking for had come. And it wasn't just the one he had been looking for. It was the one that all of Israel had been looking for. He says here, he says that Jesus is a light. He is, he is the salvation which has been prepared in the sight of all nations, a light of, for revelation to the Gentiles, the glory of your people, Israel. You see, Jesus is God's promise to the world. He's God's promise to the world, not just for Simeon. Jesus Jesus wasn't just for him. He wasn't just for Joseph. He wasn't just for Mary. He wasn't just for the Israelites. Simeon declared that he is a light to the Gentiles and a glory for Israel. That means he's a light for you. Jesus came to everyone. Amen? He came to everyone. He came for you. He came for your friend. He came for your enemy. He came for your neighbor. He came for your coworker. He came for your boss. He came for your niece and your nephew. He came for your cousin. He came for your uncle. He came for that guy that cut you off in traffic. He came for him too. Everyone. He came to bring light in the darkness, hope to the hopeless, sight to the blind, healing to the sick. Jesus came to bring peace to the troubled, joy to those in sorrow. That's why Jesus came. And he's God's promise He's God's promise. And I love that Simeon was waiting for a promise. He was waiting. He was hanging on. I wonder, I wonder what that was like for Simeon. I wonder if Simeon ever got a cold or ever got the flu. And he was, and, and he was not feeling so well and he was feeling really sick. But, oh God, you said, you gave me a promise, God. You gave me a promise, God. I, my eyes will see your Savior. You have a promise for me, God. And he held on to that promise. And you have a promise too. You're, this world has a promise, and that promise is Jesus. And we come to church services like this. Maybe, maybe you've never been to church before. And that's great that you're here today. You, some people come to church, you know, and you don't even know what you're waiting for. Sometimes we don't know what we're waiting for. We just go out and we try to do our life and sometimes we're like, I don't know how this is going to work out. And yet there's something within us that says, man, there's something bigger than all of this. There's something bigger than all of this small stuff that you're dealing with. There's something bigger than all of this quarreling. There's something bigger than all of this temporary trouble. And we look at our lives and I think sometimes we don't even know what we're waiting for that we don't even know how much God can do in our lives. We don't even know the peace that Jesus really can bring to us. We don't even know the measure of the hope that God can give us. 
We don't even know how much he can set us free from the things that we've been carrying all these years. And yet we know in our heart there's got to be something greater than this. There's got to be something more. And some of you have discovered that greatness. Some of you have discovered that God has come and he's opened the door for something for you in your life. Something that changes your situation. Some of you have found yourself in situations that you never would have dreamed up. You found yourself in places, and I talked about this last week, in Joseph's lives that we'll find ourselves in these places that we didn't expect to find ourselves in. We find ourselves in circumstances. We find ourselves in tragedy. We find ourselves in these places. And we need something to come in the middle of that. We need something to cut through. We need something to come and, and to change the tone of our situation, to change the course of the direction that we're going. We have a loved one who is heading down a path that breaks our heart, and we don't know how to save them. We've tried, and we've told them everything, and we've given them all the advice, and we've sent them all the articles, and we've done everything we can to do to help. But the only thing that's going to cut through all of that is God's promise to the world, and that's Jesus. That's the only thing. He is the one who can bring peace that you haven't been able to find for yourself. He's the one who is salvation to anyone who receives him. Jesus. That's who you're waiting for. And in the, in the questions of our life, there are so many people in our world that are waiting for something. And you can ask them, they say they're stuck. You ever talk to a frustrated person? I don't know. I don't know what the point of all this is. I don't, I don't know. And I just, so hopeless. And, and, and you want them to do something? You want them to change something? And what do you ask them? You say, what are you waiting for? Do something. What are you waiting for? Get out there. What are you waiting for? The answer to that question is simply Jesus. That's who we're waiting for. I don't know, can anything change? I wish I could change something. Well, what are you waiting for? God's promise has been delivered, Jesus. He is the answer, and his word is alive and active. Anything that you can need, you can find in God's word. Anything. I promise you anything. I, I would try to come up with something. I don't know. Send me an email and say, this isn't in God's word. We'll talk about it. It is. He is the answer. Amen. And maybe like Simeon, you found yourself at the church. You're saying, God, I need, I, I need you to show up. I need you to show up here in my life. I know you've shown up before. I know you can, but God showed up. He showed up once in Jesus, and that's all it took. One time. He came, sent his son into the world as a baby to walk among us, to deliver us. He gave us abundant life. Our church's name is Abundant Life, and there is no abundant life outside of Jesus. Yeah. There's just mediocre life. Yeah. There's just try everything I can and hope I find something that works life. There's depressed life. There's, I feel worthless about myself, life. That's the kind of life without Jesus. But God sent his promise, Jesus. In a manger, as a baby. And I imagine him in the arms of Simeon, holding that promise for the first time. Holding on to that promise. Wow, God, you did it. You did it. But I need you to know, friends, that Jesus is more than a baby in a manger. He's a savior on a cross. He came for you and for me. He gave his life for you. He gave his life for you. I love that as a church that once a month we receive communion together because it's a reminder. You may have never heard this message before. You may have never heard that Jesus came for you. You may have never heard that Jesus gave his life for you so that you could live a life abundant. Or you may have heard that message a hundred times or a thousand times. And yet there's still power in the fact that Jesus gave his life for me. He gave his life for me. That when I wake up some days and I'm feeling hopeless, when I'm feeling frustrated, Jesus gave his life 
for grumpy Brad as much as he did worshiping Brad. Amen? He gave his life for you and for me. And that gift, that's a bigger gift than anyone could ever give. I mean, some of you are going to open some gifts this year on Christmas, and they're going to be big. They're going to be wow. They're going to be jaw-dropping. Like your parents are going to get out their camera phones, right? Their phones on their camera, and they're going to film it, right? And they're going to look for that reaction. But the gift that Jesus is is so much bigger than all of that. So much bigger because he brings us joy and peace and hope and life and peace with God. That's Jesus. And I love that we can learn from Simeon. We can learn that in our lives that sometimes we're just waiting for something to change. We're just sitting back and saying, I wish something would change here. I wish it would change. And it all begins, the change begins in our life when we, either for the first time or for the hundredth time, say, Jesus, I receive you in. You're the beginning of whatever needs to change in my life. You're the beginning of whatever it is that's not going right and I need to change. You're it, Jesus. You're God's promise to me. You're God's promise that when I walk in hopeless and dark times, when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. He's the promise. And some of you today know a Jesus that's in these pages. Or you know a Jesus that's lyrics on a screen. Or you know a Jesus, or you've been walking with Jesus, and you say, yeah, I know Jesus, I serve Jesus, I try to be a good Christian, but today, either for the first time or for the second time or for the hundredth time, maybe what you need to do is you need to say, Jesus, I'm going to receive you here to be close to me, to be the one who guides my heart, to be the one who rules my life, to be the one who sets my tone and sets my direction, the one who I allow to correct me. Oh, man, you love correction, right? Does anyone love constructive criticism, which just means criticism when we hear it, right? But, man, if you have no one in your life who can speak something to you to bring correction to your life, you're in a world of trouble. And it, but it starts with Jesus. Jesus, you correct me. You show me where I'm going the wrong way. And bring Jesus in close today, the way Simeon did, right in his arms. Jesus, you're what I need. You're what I've been waiting for. Some of you have been walking with Jesus for a long time. And I think today, again, for you to be able to say to Jesus, Jesus, in this season that I'm in, you're what I'm waiting for. You're what I need. I've tried it all. I've tried everything, God. It's not working. Jesus, you're all I've got. And watch him work. Would you stand with me this morning? I want to pray for you. Mike's going to lead us. Would you just close your eyes? Let's just close our eyes before the Lord. And I want you to just even imagine this scene in the temple with Simeon. Where Simeon's in there and he's waiting. He is just waiting. God's got something for me. I know it. He said it. But I just, I keep coming here and I haven't seen it yet. And I want you to just imagine, I want you to put yourself in his place now. Where you're Simeon, you're standing there. You're standing there in the church and you're just waiting. And in comes Jesus. And Mary places him in your arms. And you can look at Jesus and say, you're all I ever needed. You see, there's something within us that's waiting for a Savior. At times, I, I think we don't know what that looks like, but we know there's something more. And Simeon discovered Jesus is the answer to that question, what are you waiting for? So I want to pray for you this morning. As we just kind of are here together in this moment of reflection with our eyes closed, if you're in a place in your life where you say, you know, I, I've never invited Jesus to be that Savior. I've never, I've never looked to Jesus to be the one to change my life. And I want to receive salvation in my life today. If you're in that place today, would you just raise your hand quickly? I want to pray for you. 
specifically. Thank you, Lord. Yes, God. Yes, God. If you're in a place today where you're saying, you know, I'm going through some things right now. Or maybe you've drifted from, from the Lord. Or Jesus is just an idea. Or good life advice. A clean way to live. Maybe you're feeling hopeless. Maybe you're in a situation where there's division all around you. And you say, I need Jesus to show up in the middle of it all. And today you say, I, I, I want to receive Jesus and invite him into my situation. To invite him into what's going on in the middle of my life. Would you just raise your hand? I want to pray for you as well. We just invite you, Jesus, in the middle of this. We invite you, Jesus. Would you just say that? I invite you, Jesus, into this. I invite you, Jesus, to come close. We just invite him. Just say, Jesus, I invite you to come close. I invite you to come close. If you would just pray this prayer with me, Jesus, we invite you to come close in our lives. Jesus, I look to you as my Savior. Lord, bring correction to me where I need it. Lord, forgive my sin. Lord, I take my eyes off of my solution. And I place them on you, Jesus. I put my hope in you, Jesus. I put my trust in you. I put my faith in you, Jesus. Would you come? Would you bring your peace? Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I pray right now, Lord, for your church, Lord God, this season and these days ahead, for that peace of God to come and reign within us. That as we live our lives, Lord, that we would be able to experience even this week you working in our lives, that we would, oh, our eyes would be open to see where you're working, to see where your peace is present, to see where your goodness is abounding, to see where your joy is plentiful. I pray, Lord God, that you would open our eyes to see. Lord, would you come into situations, I pray, Lord, right now into places in families that have experienced brokenness, where there is strife in families. Lord God, I pray healing in the name of Jesus in those families. Lord, I pray for families that are divided over the gospel of Jesus. I pray, Lord God, that you would come and bring salvation to those homes in every way. Lord God, I pray for those that are uncertainty this morning, uncertainty over their finances, over their health, over direction and next steps. Lord God, I pray, Lord God, that you would bring a certainty in their lives, that you would come, Jesus, and that you would bring a peace in those places, Lord God. We look to you, Jesus. Because you alone are good. You alone are able. We turn our eyes to you now, Jesus. And we look upon your promise to us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. You are good, Lord. You are so good. We worship you today. Thank you, Lord.